All right, everybody, good morning. Thank you for joining us for November Gate Equity Webinar, where we explore topics related to equity and graduation success. This webinar is recorded, and we're working on our process for making our webinars ADA compliant. So stay tuned for those recordings with captions. The PowerPoint is posted on OSPI on the Gate Equity Webinar page under Archive. So if you want to follow along, I've pasted that link into the chat. And you should be able to just click on it and go right to the PowerPoint if you'd like it. We'd like to ask that you direct the questions that you want us to answer to the Q&A part, not the chat, so that we can more easily monitor and make sure that we're responding to you. Chat's more for your own commentary, so feel free to use that as well. Uh, I'm Kathy Anderson, OSPI Graduation Equity Program Supervisor. Today's topic is freshman success, relationships, relevance, rigor, and reflection. I'm joined today by Dixie Grunenfelder, OSPI Director of K-12 System Supports, and we're also featuring Lake Chelan High School to talk about how they are building a supportive system for their freshmen. We're glad everybody could be here today, and we're so glad our audience is here. What a great response. Uh, Superintendent Reichdahl's K-12 vision has three phases, each lasting two years, from small improvements to a full redesign of the K-12 education system. The goal of our education system is to prepare all of our students for post-secondary aspirations, careers, and life. According to a 2014 analysis done by the Washington State Institute of Public Policy, we know that each graduate creates benefits of more than half a million dollars in higher earnings as well as societal savings in areas such as healthcare, unemployment, compared to students that don't graduate. Underpinning graduation are key intermediate measures, including attendance discipline and ninth grade course failure. Looking at ninth grade course failure is a great barometer for the health of your district overall. Elementary and middle schools can look at it as the culmination of what they've been doing, and high schools can see it as a foretelling of graduation rates to come. They're definitely related. We're zeroing in on ninth grade success because in research done by the University of Chicago, we know that freshman year is a bottleneck. Their research states, student performance is so poor that they're unable to recover. These negative experiences in freshman year put students at high risk of not graduating which later prevents them from participating in the mainstream economy and larger society. We cannot hope to substantially improve graduation rates unless we substantially improve students' course performance in their freshman year. So, also from Chicago's research, we know that students who end their ninth grade year on track are four times more likely to graduate than those who are off track. Ninth grade failure is a better predictor of that graduation than race, ethnicity, level of poverty, or test scores. So if you want the biggest bang for your buck, it's great to look at attendance and uh, freshman course failure. Because it's strongly tied to attendance, almost all students who have good attendance finish their freshman year on track. And students attend class more often when they have strong relationships with their teachers and when they see school and the coursework as relevant and important to their future. Our goals for today are to catch you up on what's happening with Every Student Succeeds Act, or as we call it, ESSA. You'll also get some practical advice on systems change from Lake Chelan, and we'll give you some resources to help you along the way. Ninth grade course failure is becoming an accountability measure for schools, and Dixie is going to tell you a little more about it. Thanks, Kathy. Again, this is Dixie Grunenfelder, Director of K-12 System Supports here at OSPI. Thank you all for joining us this morning. And I've been asked to uh, provide a little update on ESSA. Um, when we think about ESSA here at OSPI, we're really talking about uh, the accountability side of, of the work. And our K-12 System Support division is now part of the Office of System and School Improvement. And strategically aligning accountability with the support systems here at OSPI, uh, the administration and leadership feels that, uh, will, that that will result in real progress for all schools and particularly targeting those schools that are in improvement. So um, if we think about ESSA as the foundation or the bridge between um, what's what's we're being held accountable to and the supports um, 
it really is the underpinning of the why. And the key components of ESSA are an emphasis on equality. So um, you'll see, and probably you've, you've seen many of the webinars and materials that have been coming out, and, and I would encourage you, if you want more in-depth knowledge of ESSA, to visit the OSPI website and type ESSA in the search box, and you will get more information than probably you want. But there's been recorded webinars and materials produced uh, to keep everybody up to date. Um, so as we wait for our plan to be improved from the, uh, improved, sorry, approved from the from the Department of Education, we're moving forward with with building the system um, as as uh, to prepare for those the the new way of doing business in the new year. So. Um, emphasis on equity, looking at all schools, although we are in the Office of System and School Improvement, uh, the focus of K-12 system support remains supporting all schools. And we also have a new uh, Assistant Superintendent of uh, Educator Effectiveness, and she is key to our leadership team here. And really is a focus on flexibility of resources and providing um, the roadmap and the opportunity to access those resources in the best way uh, schools and districts see fit. So uh, here's a, just a couple bullet points that I pulled out um, of that plethora of ESSA information that's posted on the website. These are some key points that I found. Uh, as far as school selection, you may have heard that there'll be many more schools in improvement um, or in that improvement status for, for a couple reasons. When we looked at school selection, instead of looking for uh, schools that had certain um, student populations of 10 or more, they're now looking at a three-year grouping, and if there's 20 or more students in a student subgroup over three years, um, they can be included in the improvement uh, process. So uh, it opens up the door for more schools to be included and, and based on, on those numbers of students. Also expanded the measures within the ESSA, um, specifically ninth grade course failure or ninth grade on track falls in this new category of school quality and student success measures, SQSS. And although the weight of the SQSS measures are fairly low relative to the other measures, it certainly puts these indicators, as Kathy mentioned earlier, including chronic absenteeism, ninth grade on track, that dual credit advanced course taking on the uh, accountability roadmap, uh, showing that they're important. Um, we're going to be looking at the bottom 5% of all students to receive comprehensive support, similar to the system we have now, but then we're also gonna look at the bottom 5% of students that have um, bottom 5% of subgroups. So those are schools, and that's where we're gonna see the largest growth um, in the number of schools, because they're gonna receive targeted supports. So categories such as English language learners, low income, special ed, um, the race categories will all be in these subgroups. So really taking that look at disproportionality that we've seen in the equity analytics and our work in the past, uh, a little bit more formally in the new accountability system. Uh, keep in mind that the improvement schools will be selected for 18-19 in, in the spring of 2018, and they will stay in improvement through 2020-21. So it's a three-year grouping of schools, and then the new selection will happen again in, in 2021 and then for the next three years. The data that's used to select those schools will continue to be produced on an annual basis so schools can take a look at how they're doing. Similar, again, to what we've seen with the equity analytics um, on the website, those data will still be available. And we're actually developing those data resources down to the building level so schools can actually use those in a more strategic way. Uh, but the cohort will be for three years. So here's a look at the accountability indicators, uh, again, uh, across elementary, middle, and high school. And um, as I mentioned, the um, SQSS measures on the far right-hand side of your screen are there. So for elementary and middle school, you're looking at chronic absenteeism for the SQSS indicator. And when we get to high school, then we've added ninth grade on track, which is the topic of today's webinar along with chronic absenteeism and the advanced course taking. 
So this is the, the new graphic for our Office of System and School Improvement. And the work that is in front of us is to design and implement a multi-tier system of support for the estimated 900 schools uh, that will be um, in improvement because of the new targeted uh, subgroups by January 2018, so we can be prepared. Uh, this really is um, just continues our efforts to get the best information out to schools and districts around what's working uh, in Washington State using our uh, graduation outliers and our outliers in ninth grade success, and we're so happy to have Lake Chelan with us today as well as what we're learning in research. So uh, really looking forward to continuing our efforts on the K-12 system support side to work hand in hand with school improvement, but again, to provide these resources for everyone. Keeping in mind that students and the schools that serve them are at the heart of our work. So whether we look at research or we look at what we're seeing in schools that have seen um, positive outcomes in student success, and even the, the schools that have been in the improvement process that have made the most gains, we really see similar themes come out of the work. And uh, those are what are included here on your screen. We've seen real um, intentionality around leadership and their focus on the why of the work, the mission, the clear uh, goals, and building that relational trust between staff and students and families and community. Um, we've seen well-defined continuous quality improvement processes within a multi-tiered system of support. So having those, those supports for all students, those interventions for students that need a little bit extra help, and then those wraparound supports for students that need uh, that, that intensive support. Um, definitely what we've seen work across the board in districts and buildings is um, the reliance on data both for progress monitoring and that student level work, but also strategically in evaluating programs and determining uh, next steps and direction for the work. And family and community partnerships continue to play a pivotal role in the services and the supports for, for students. So we're gonna launch a poll right now. Um, as I wrap up the SN, we transition into some of the data that Kathy's going to present. So, Kathy. So, um, to help steer my work looking at ninth grade and supporting all of you, how can we support your work around ninth grade best? Are you interested in grants, training on systems, uh, development webinars like this one, documenting what successful districts are doing, thinking about those highlight districts, uh, making communication tools, or something else. And if you have ideas, you could just type them into the chat box for us. And while we do that, if you have any questions for Dixie around Essa, um, she is here to answer them. So we'll give you just a minute to do that. And, um, Amy, if you do want to put more than one option, you can write that into the chat box for the other. <laughs> if you want all of them, that would be great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. All of the above. What's nice about the, um, the new structure of our system is we have champions around each one of these content areas. And uh, if Kepi didn't make that clear, she is our ninth grade on track champion and she, her work is um, pretty much uh, concentrated in, certainly she does a lot more, but, but she is focused on ninth grade success and creating those resources and, and building uh, the toolkit and getting you the things that you need to support ninth grade, eighth grade transition to ninth and then supporting them through ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can get Tony to share the results of that poll. Let's see how we ended up. Oh, neat. That's great stuff, everybody. Documenting what successful districts are doing and sharing their stories. That sounds a lot like Gate <laughs> webinar. That's wonderful. Awesome. Um, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your participating in the poll. That's really good to know. Um, so if you'd like to see your district's data, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that right now. Uh, you can go to the OSPI homepage and click the green data and reports button. 
and choose OSPI performance indicators and select that ninth grade course failure. The Tableau link will help you set your filters and find your district, um, although the system is gonna change a little bit in the months to come. Uh, as you look at these numbers, you can ask yourself, am I in the lowest performing 5%? Is that possible? And if so, what can I do to support freshman success today? It looks like my star moved a little bit. Uh, we chose Lake Chelan carefully. In their district, around 56% of their students are low income. And as you can see, the rate of failed courses is well below the state average. In student groups, Chelan is also well below state average. So if you look at those gray bars, that's the state. And Chelan's bars are colored there. And in their district, oops, that's it. This slide is actually really cool because you can see the trend over time. And in the past three years, their low income student failure has gone from 26% to 12%. And that gap is closing and that's a major accomplishment. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how they got there today. I wanna emphasize that as you're thinking about ninth grade success, you also think about the power of framing it in a multi-tiered system of supports or MTSS. This prevention system uses teams and data to combine response to intervention, that's RTI, and positive behavioral interventions and support, that's PBIS. It integrates a system-wide continuum of school, family, and community-based learning supports, so think resources, strategies, structures, and practices into a single coherent system. Washington MPSS calls for empowering families and strengthening community partnerships to create opportunities for all those stakeholders to engage in the work of improving academic achievement, social competence, and closing opportunity gaps. Um, in my work on ninth grade success, I read a lot of research and saw some reoccurring themes that I want you to keep in mind. As we listen to Lake Chelan's story today, I'm sure you're gonna see how their work brings the spirit of all these things together. So building a positive school culture with connections between staff, students, and families. You can use climate surveys to check. Make sure your courses are engaging. Uh, use data to monitor attendance, behavior, and coursework. That's those ABCs. Consider taking a serious look at standards-based grading. You can also prepare eighth graders coming in with things like orientation, a link crew, summer school, early registration for appropriate classes, open communication between middle and high schools about those learning expectations. So try to stay consistent with that vertical alignment. You can build in supports and get students positively involved in school with mentors, uh, social activities, social support, things like counseling, an advisory staff member who's responsible for each kid. And I also want to suggest that schedules can make a big impact. Some success has been found with flex scheduling, where you put an intervention period before lunch to get students caught up, and then bring them a lunch if they aren't caught up in time. Getting lunch with friends is a huge incentive. So uh, you may also consider creating a freshman academy, so keeping all, of, all or some of your freshmen separate from the rest, maybe adding advisory periods, using a small school model, staff teaming, block schedules, those are all options. Um, another way to support is to make now relevant to the future. So scheduling college visits, keep support for students past ninth grade, and also keeping in mind the power of that high school and beyond plan, um, making that a real living document that steers kids towards their dreams is a great thing to do. We're lucky to be joined today by some amazing people out at Lake Chelan. Uh, can each of you take a moment to introduce yourself? And I'm just gonna unmute you so you can speak. Oh, you're good. Hi. Hi, good morning, my name's Sarah. Um, I'm a school and community liaison for Chelan School District. And then I also teach our ninth grade academic success class. And the mentoring program that goes with that. Hi, my name is Crosby Carpenter. I'm the associate principal of Chelan High School. I'm also CT director and the principal of our uh, choice project-based learning high school, which is Chelan School of Innovation. I'm Brad Wilson. I'm the Chelan High School principal. Thanks. Great. Um, 
Do you guys want to tell us a little bit about your um, your school districts? Sure. Do you want? Uh... Sorry, I'm gonna figure out how to share your screen here. Sorry, guys. Technical difficulties. We will figure this out. Okay. Um, our school district, you know, we have about 1,400 kids district wide. Our high school covers between 440 and, and 460. Um, you know, the big changes that we have seen over the, the last five years is, uh, you know, a 7% increase in our Hispanic Latino student number and a 9% increase, you know, in our transitional bilingual students, which was about a doubling of that uh, number of students in our high school. So, you know, we're always trying to stay aware of that. And as the students change, the, the needs change and trying to, to keep up with the needs and make sure we're addressing those. Um, we're, you know, really a, an interesting community. We have a very big tourist economy and a lot of high-end homes, but also, you know, a high amount of, of poverty, um, a lot of workers in the tree fruit industry, you know, that live in our school district. So, you know, we can see both ends of the spectrum. Great. If you want to, you can hit share screen over there, and they'll be able to see your screen. You see it at the bottom? Okay. So that's a little bit about our district. Um, where this work primarily began in focusing on the, the freshman students and their need uh, to get more intervention to help prevent uh, course failure was, um, you know, January of 2013, the end of the first semester under our, our previous principal, who's now our superintendent, Barry DePauli. You know, it was the, the numbers you could see there. Um, you know, 63 students out of a class of you know, right around 100 or so had a D or an F, you know, in their the end of the first semester of their freshman year. And obviously, you know, that was a, a huge concern and just the realization that you know, high freshman course failure makes the rest of those students' high school careers a lot more challenging and can affect their life opportunities. And it, it stresses your entire school system when you're playing catch up for such a high number of students right from the beginning. So, uh, you know, Mr. DePauli at the time identified the, the issue as being, you know, not a, a student problem that, that required the, the fixing of students, but uh, that the problem needed to be addressed directly. And that's so that students weren't getting enough help. They were falling through the cracks. And a lot, a lot of the times when the, the students were surveyed, and Sarah could speak to this, um, many of them felt like they, they weren't connected to the school at all. Like there was just, you know, their families weren't connected. They weren't connected. And it didn't really matter if they were successful or not. So um, Mr. DePauli, the principal at the time, went directly to some junior and senior student leaders who he felt could help impact other students and, and ask them on behalf of the school and the, the freshmen in need if they'd be willing to give up a period of their day to serve as mentors to struggling freshman students on a daily basis for, for one class period. And, um, you know, that got those students on board. And then I believe some support from Gear Up was solicited to help train those students and to, to get the problem started. And he also went to, to Sarah, who was serving as a family community liaison at that time, and asked her to be the, the, the teacher for the program and to run the class and, and plan for the class on a, a daily basis. So that was... That was how the, the work on the specific academic success program uh, was started. You know, overall, when asked about a, a process for building a system, anytime we need to, uh, to address a problem in our school, I think we really try to focus on uh, collaboration, you know, and, and allocation. It's, so we try to collaborate. It's not, you know, one person, you know, just banking on the superstar teacher, the superstar uh you know, program that it has to be a shared effort, a collaboration between everybody involved and, and everybody that has some thinking. And, you know, even if that the initial thinking is not what solves the problem, I believe even with like, 
like the academic success class initially they were trying to help those freshmen by pulling them in at lunch and for doing work but you know nobody's really excited to do extra work when they're losing their lunch period so that was an example of some thinking that that morphed into to something different because it wasn't working great and i think the allocation part's important too as you'll hear about when we talk about you know a variety of our programs and the academic success class we allocate a lot of resources both both human and financial to making sure that, that systems are supported and work if you even the best laid plans if there's not a, a proper allocation of resources to help them be successful they're they're not going to work so i think that's important to remember you know our our system um you know, we have the kind of the tier three is the foundation because really that's going to determine the success of your school. What happens to deal with the, the high needs individual students that need wraparound services on, on a daily basis. Um, you know, some other pieces in there. I think you talked about preparedness and alignment with your middle school. Uh, we're fortunate to be in a in a shared building. So. You know, two times a month, our teachers meet in content teams, uh, 6 through 12. And I think that's been going on. This is the third year of that. That really helps everybody have an idea of what the, the expectation is at the high school level and the, the freshman level. And those teachers are constantly working together on what the, the learning continuum is for those students and what they're going to need to be able to do to be successful. And everybody's on the same page. It's not about blaming the middle school or you know the middle school solely existing to serve the high school they work together to to align their curriculum and to develop strategies that'll, that'll reach all the students so i think that's a, a key factor that that does take uh you know allocation of funds we have a late start day every monday you know that our district supports um also you know we do some targeted advisories we do have an advisory period four times a, a week in uh, after a couple weeks of school, we try to get kids who are in need of extra math help into an advisory with their math teacher so they can get that extra support. And then, uh, you know, down on the, for our tier three kids, like talk about attendance being a, a big piece. One thing we've really improved this year, I feel is we have a school resource officer and we'll send him out to go pick a student up if we know they're struggling attendance wise and they're not here in the morning. So little pieces like that. Then I think you always want to recognize where success is happening too. Um, you know, we had a Sarah started last year uh, a banquet for our academic success class mentors and mentees to, to recognize their contribution. Um, we try to honor good attendance by you know, letting the grade level with the fewest tardies out early for lunch. Uh, we're going to try. We recognize our, our students quarterly who have over ninety five percent attendance. And then we really put a lot of effort into some end of the year evening of excellence awards where students in all our content areas and perseverance um, are recognized for for their excellence you know in front of their parents and other students at a big evening event so those are some some strategies we feel are, are real important and i think also some pieces we have you know in our, our tier one that address all freshmen are uh very important and Crosby's going to talk a little bit about our, our freshman CTE rotation. So our, our CT department's broken into, into five different pathways, and the, the mission of our CT department is to make sure that we're aligned with 21st century industries, and, and more importantly than that, to make sure that it's regionally relevant, locally relevant. So just like you know, Everett's going to, going to have a, a pretty great uh, bioengineering program for aerospace, we're, we're more focused on hospitality tourism business marketing, agriculture, biomedical science, and engineering. Uh, we're the, one of the first schools in the state to offer a viticulture course this year that we're piloting as part of our agriculture program. Uh, within our CT department, our, our freshmen all take a rotation class first period, and that's a quarter-long rotation class that they rotate four times a year. Uh, we have five pathways. One of those pathways, agriculture, is actually that, that intro class is offered at the middle school level. But those classes have a heavy emphasis on design thinking, and it really breaks down the perception and barriers with uh, all students, but specifically our our non traditional students. You know, we we had a, a girl who's Hispanic, and in her freshman year, she had an intro to design class. 
and took all of our, our architecture and engineering classes. And, and last year she applied for a program to called girl garage out of, out of Berkeley and was accepted to go down for a week and kind of a design Institute. And she came back from that even more empowered than before. And it was interesting to hear her, her talk and say that, you know, I never thought of myself as an engineer and, and that word used to scare her. And now she's, you know, she's, she's one of the leaders in our school and, and really empowered around that. Same thing. We have a ninth grade boy who in eighth grade uh, had, had chronic failure, chronic absenteeism. And he's in our, our Teals rotation class now, computer science rotation class. And uh, again, feeling very empowered. Uh, he's actually he's quite the rock star in the class and, and has gotten to the point now where he's, he's doing a lot of the teaching in that class and is asked to be put back in that class as a, as a TA at some point. So we're exploring that option as well. And uh, I'm going to buzz through these next ones so that we, we get where we want to want to go. But just I think it's really important that you can't ever forget that the, the power of the classroom teacher. And I think, you know, we measure freshman failure in math, ELA, and science. And I think we have pretty special, uh, special people doing special things in all those areas. These next three slides are our algebra teacher, uh, Ken Barnes, tracks the students based on their eighth grade SBAC and their their eighth grade uh, math grade, and then compares that, you know, progressively through the year to how they're performing in the class on their summative assessments and color codes that so a student can see how they're doing. So here were our eighth graders last year at the start of the year. Here they were at the end of the first quarter, you know, in each of our three algebra periods. And there they were at the end of the year. So they can, you know, their names are there. They're able to see their success in uh, – in science, we offer STEM, uh, STEM design science and principles of biomedical science to our freshmen. Both of those are high engagement science classes that get the kids using design thinking and, um, you know, help them engage and not just be in a, a sit and get mentality. And then in our, our English classes, classes, our freshman teachers really focus on teaching academic behaviors and a growth mindset through a heavy emphasis on revision. And I think that serves our, our freshmen very well. Um, you know, another thing we do is we have a very robust uh, club program. So the expectation at, at Chelan High School, something we talk about with freshmen at the beginning of the year in our freshman orientation assembly is that all students at Chelan High School uh, are expected to play either one sport or be involved in, in one club. And, we have something we're really proud of is our, our club program here. We have over 13 official clubs at our school, which for a, a school of, you know, hovering around 450 kids is, uh, we feel is pretty impressive. Over 75% of our students are involved in at least one club and multiple students are involved in, in three or four clubs. Uh, one of the, you know, I guess it's a good problem to have is, is we hear about kids being overextended and, and it just shows you the, some of the, the neat things that are happening within those clubs, uh, community service opportunities and extended learning opportunities. Uh, I think one thing that really bolsters our culture at Chelan High School is that those clubs create an inclusive culture with overlapping student interests so that you're going to have students in multiple clubs uh, interacting with each other where they might not have, uh, have interacted with each other before, but they're interacting around a, a common theme or a, a shared passion for something. Uh, at the beginning of the year, our, our ASB hosts a club fair for every freshman. So freshmen come into the gym during advisory, and each club takes a turn kind of putting on a song and dance and, and recruiting kids. And it's one way we, we up those numbers and, and retain students through club, clubs yeah. at the high school. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to, to Sarah now. She's going to talk a little bit about what some of the identified barriers were for those freshman students that were really struggling and – what goes on in the, uh, the academic success class and how awesome the results are that, uh, that come out of that. Oh, hi. Um, as you can see on that slide, um, when we talked to the students and said, you know, why, why the low grades in eighth grade and in middle school, um, the reasons are lack of family support, lack of role models, um, their friends, bullying, social problems, lack of connection, not having an adult on staff that they're connected to. Sometimes it's grief. Um, they lost a parent or a grandparent and shut down organization. Maybe they were suicidal or depressed. 
just a general lack of motivation and apathy for school, attendance issues. So um, really, that is our, that is our curriculum. Um, so I think that um, as we set to design this class, I think it would be a mistake to assume that the remedy for academic failure would be academic support. Um, if the kids are saying that these other problems are um, the reason they're not doing well in school, and a lot of times they do feel capable, they just didn't care, then it made a lot of sense to me to um, provide tutoring as a part of it, but... Um, you want me to hit it or you got to hit it? Oh, ready? you can. Okay. Um, but um, not just have tutoring as our curriculum and really get into these other areas and, and thinking of ways we could increase support. So academic success class is a class that meets every day. And we have a balance of academics and social emotional learning and, um, and a real focus on the will and the skill. And we, so number one is relationship, relationship, relationship. That's, we use the YTRI program to train our mentors and that is their biggest emphasis, but we also teach resilient strategies. So we, um, I'd like to go into the journey a little bit. I was trained in the YTRI program about six years ago in my first year on this job, and I was very interested in it. I took a group of very at-risk freshman girls and did the curriculum with them, and it, the results were really fantastic. And um, one of my students said, Mrs. Barnes, I, this has made such a big difference in my life. I want to have my own group. So she sought out about 10 eighth grade girls who were struggling and failing their classes. And she and her best friend who was the ASB president had their own group and met at lunch. And we really saw huge gains with those girls. Um, and she said, why can't we be trained in Y-Try? And I said, well, that's a, that's a program for adults and teachers. It's not for kids. And she said, I know, but why can't we be trained? Why not us? And I really didn't have a good answer. So that's kind of the evolution of <clears throat> how we got to academic success class is students who want to make a difference and want to be part of something bigger than themselves and make an impact on others coming to us and we're saying, wow, um, we have this resource in our school. It's, we do put resources toward it financially, but it's still very cost effective and, and pretty cheap. So why would we not use students to be part of the solution to help these freshmen have um, the best freshman year possible? So that's what we've done. Um, this is just last year's data. We're in our fourth year of the program. As I said, our goal is to help freshmen have the best freshman year possible, but we do track data. So we, in eighth grade, we measured their core classes because our eighth grade has a seven period day and our high school is a five period day. Um, so we have to compare apples to apples. But in the core classes, we went from 22 Fs to zero. Um, they raised their GPA over, over a whole point, um, significantly reduced office referrals and their absences. So um, every year, the data has been um, really dramatic in the gains. And we've seen students that got virtually all Fs in eighth grade, even get 4.0s, 3.9s, and make drastic turnarounds in their freshman year, which is super exciting. So, sure, yes. So some of the things that we do, I mentioned that we train the mentors. They come out of the training really excited. Um, I, I do a PLC with the mentors, just like our district does with the teachers. That's a place where they can connect 
um, problem solve, have a team approach to the successes that we can celebrate and the problems that need to be solved in the class. Try to create a family culture. Um, I, much like a teacher is having ongoing training, so do the mentors. So I, when I learn something new at a conference, I try to teach them about trauma. I teach them about restorative justice. Um, I pass on things that I've learned about motivation, of course, the wide try curriculum, um, and just anything that I think will help, that helps me in my job in student services, I pass on to them, and that really makes them feel special and like they're part of kind of an adjunct staff um, and part of our team at the high school here. Um, and then we balance social, emotional learning and academics. And that, that social emotional piece along with academic, you know, we definitely realize as a district it's very important. We're very fortunate all the way from the superintendent's office and the, the boardroom. They understand the importance of the, the whole child and the need to address that and the need to give supports for that. You know, for a school district our size to have two family and community liaisons is huge. I think Sarah can speak a little bit to, you know, what, how important family connections are to, to the success of our kids. Yeah, we have um, we have some really exciting programs, um, including the Family Leadership Institute and strengthening families, where families are coming in and getting some of these these strategies and connecting with the school. And we really try to make school feel like home to them. We also go go to them when they can't come to us um, because we have a um, a lot of sheds in the area, a lot of um, schedules that make it tough for parents, especially with the language barrier to get to the school, sometimes we go to them and just say, hey, how can we support you? And that seems to go a long way. They really trust us in issues of immigration, in issues of um, documentation, um, just, just really anything. Um, the strong relationship serves us very well. When we say shed, what we're referring to is the, the fruit tree packing sheds where, where a lot of our, our parents work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So shockingly enough, freshmen uh, will make mistakes from time to time. Um, you know, and we, we really try to make sure that, uh, you know, we address them the same way with the overall thinking that we're trying to solve problems, not just hammer the students. So I think Crosby can speak a little bit to, to what we have as far as discipline intervention. Brad and I, we look at discipline as, or, or discipline intervention as being very you know, relationship based. So we spend a significant amount of time building relationships with all students in the school. Um, we, we place an emphasis. We, we call it kind of a restorative justice light. I wouldn't say that we're 100% restorative justice, but we, a couple of years ago, brought in uh, the Restorative Justice Center in the Northwest to run a training for middle school, high school, and our, our choice high school. And, you know, we, we take each, each situation on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sometimes it, it calls for restorative justice, and sometimes it doesn't. But really the, the, the foundation of all of that is, is relationships. And then also asking why, you know, asking a student why something's happening. And, and as we all know, understanding that every student has a story behind their actions. Uh, Brad and I, you know, we make it clear to students that the principal's office is a safe spot. It's not a scary spot. Once you get into the, the, those four walls and, and you shut the door, you can yell, scream, swear, whatever you need to do to, to vent and, and communicate your, your needs to us, and we're not going to judge you based on that. Um, some things we do in terms of intervention, you know, we've, we've worked pretty closely with a motivational speaker named Mike Smith and the Harbor, and that's, that's hosted through Jostens. If you, if you go to uh, Jostens Harbor, they run weekly episodes um, that are, are pretty good. We send those out in advisory and try to build out some curriculum around those. Uh, we've also ran an anti-cyberbullying campaign this year. We print up a couple thousand postcards every year and give those out to teachers. And we, we usually pick a specific class and then we'll have address label, labels made for that class with the idea being that every student has an address label made for them. And then the goal is for teachers to make sure that they're sending out some sort of positive message on that postcard to all students that they have address labels for during the school year. Uh, in addition to, we give them a, an extra stack of postcards just to pass around. So it's kind of fun to see those, those postcards uh, pass between staff members, pass from students to, or from staff to students, and, and sometimes from students to staff. Uh, you know, 
I think, I think there's a there's a lot of a lot of value in incentives and and disincentives. You know, in the next week we'll be running our first quarter. We ran our first quarter attendance data, and we'll be offering a uh, like a lunch ice cream social for for kids with few, like ninety five percent or better attendance. And then really the the root of it is tr empowering teachers to uh, resolve conflict in their classrooms. And you know, Brad and I don't see a lot of a lot of discipline. Uh, a lot of that, what we call those three Ds, the defiance, disruption, disrespect, a lot of that's handled in the classroom. We feel that a lot of it's solved through the connections that advisors and coaches make with students in our, our sports and in our, our club system as well. Yeah. So you, you think about the, the importance of providing tier three support supports to your, your students. I think you know, we do a, a special job of that, like I said, and a lot of that's because of the realization, you know, all the way throughout our district that, you know, it's our job to care for all the students' needs. So in our, in our student services department, in our middle school, high school, you know, for a, a district our size, I think we're real fortunate to have a full-time high school counselor and a full-time middle school counselor, a registrar, our two, uh, you know, part-time family and community liaisons. I say part-time because they're paid part-time. They do overtime type of work. Um, you know, we have an assessment technology and intervention coordinator that works out of our student services department. Throughout the course of every week, we have four visiting mental health professionals uh, work out of a small office in our right in our student services area and meet with kids. We have a registered nurse. And then at the, the high school, we feel fortunate that we have a principal and an associate principal slash CTE director, you know, for a school our size. Uh, Sarah can talk a little bit about just a, a few of the things that we do out of our student services department to, to wrap around the whole child. Yeah, well, um, I'd just like to highlight the challenges become opportunities um, portion. We have a, like, just like with the peer mentors, we have a lot of community support. So um, I can think of a student that was having some hygiene issues and you know, was living out of a camp trailer and hadn't showered in a few weeks, you know, that, that is an opportunity right there. Um, I, we use our invest ed and we use our, uh, a local nonprofit that we have. And, um, I was able to take that student shopping and that's an hour of bonding right there. Um, with high poverty comes high trauma and, you know, the kids struggling with, a lot of the residual effects of trauma, we have that conversation with them, but we always take a strengths-based approach. What they've gone through and what they've survived would make them a fantastic leader, a fantastic mentor. Um, the anger that they may have from something they're experiencing can actually be gas in your motivation tank when you're able to reframe them, reframe that challenge for them. So I just think our student services team is is really good at reframing and um, looking for any way to increase and develop relationships and turn those challenges in into opportunities. Yeah. So I mean, overall, when we asked for for advice to start this work. I think it's really important that, you know, we have a we is, is greater than me type of at attitude throughout our system, both in the adults and students in the building. We talk to the students about taking care of each other, looking out for each other. Um, and adult-wise, we, we understand that when we work together, you know, it's not just about, you know, go in your, your classroom and, and be a superstar teacher. And we definitely have people that are superstar teachers, but, you know, they realize they're, they're part of something bigger than themselves and that, you know, that's what impacts the students with the highest needs, those students from trauma, those students, you know, living in massive poverty is the, the attitude that, that everybody here is working on, you know, the behalf of the students and they're the most important people in the building. Sarah Crosby, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the, the notion that it's not a one size fits all, right? So we look at, when we're, we're looking at options for kids, we ask the question, you know, what's best for all of our students in the district? So, some kids are going to be more successful in a traditional high school classroom, uh, others in a CT classroom, others at the tech school, others at our Schlant School of Innovation, others at Running Start. And it's, it's not about, it's not a zero-sum game. It's, it's, it's all about looking at what's the best option for, for that student 
and, and also understanding that not every teacher needs to teach the same way or think the same way because different teachers are going to connect with different kids in different ways, but it's, it's about developing a critical mass that's moving in the, the direction you've established uh, as a district. Yeah, we, we talk about, you know, water and the bamboo and the, the grad rate. You know, we're struggling. We're working on what to do with, with sophomores, specifically sophomores that come from a, a super supported uh, freshman year academic success class and hit a very challenging sophomore year with a very rigorous class load and how to help them, you know, keep on that positive uh, continuing upward and not start having course failures again. Um, one thing that we, we always talk about is just the, the power of hiring awesome people. You know, we have eight new people on our staff this year out of about 30. That's a, a huge percentage. You know, we really value positivity and people that are relational, you know, is more than experience or, or something else when we're looking for, for new people. And, you know, if you're able to do that and, and hire awesome people that are team players, you're able to put the, the negative negative people, if you have any of those in your school, uh, you know, on an island and not put them in a position where they're going to drive the, the conversation. But, the, you know, the people that are, are on board with we and the positivity are going to drive the conversations and the solutions and the, the collaboration. So along with that hiring, if you go back five years, 65% of our staff are new in the last five years. I feel like we've done a done a good job of hiring and putting the right people in the right places. You know, and it's not easy. I mean, we get one, two applicants. We have to recruit. Um, we have two people on our staff right now that two years ago, one was teaching in Thailand, one in Australia. I mean, we <laughs> anything you can do to get quality people is definitely worth the, the investment of, of time and, and resources. And then we, you know, I think you constantly need to check yourself and if you're if your school believes in its mission and beliefs and vision, and then if you're living those out, you know, we just looked at this at a staff meeting this morning talking about how do we know if this is or is not happening in, in our school. All right. I think that's all we have. So I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Kathy now. All right. Thanks guys. I really appreciate it. We do have a couple of questions. So um, just thinking about your, with a five period day, how do you meet your 24 credit requirement? So the first two classes of the day are block classes. So they're one credit per semester classes. Then the, our three afternoon periods are around 50 minutes or so. And those are year long classes. So a student has a chance for seven credits a year, or 28 over the course of four years. Our, our, our graduation requirement is 26 credits. Yeah, we actually, re we've always required 26. So the, the core 24 wasn't a huge issue that we had to address. Cool. Um, how do you pay for the visiting mental health counselors? That's free. Um, we have SAGE which is a, a state resource um, and our local cl health clinic. We also have, um, you know, Catholic family is willing to come all the resource and, and anyone that's not free, they bill and it just eliminates the parent barrier. So that's just a hundred percent free to our school. If we can give them a space. Um, and how do you select your students for your academic success class? That is done largely by the eighth grade counselor and principal who knows the students. I don't select them, but they really look at kids who may be really at risk, either um, socially, um, behaviorally, or grades wise, and who would really benefit from increased support. Mm -hmm. and, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was really trying to rely on the, the middle school knowledge. I think that collaboration we have is key in identifying those students as well. I know, you know, when I was the middle school principal for three years before I moved to the high school, I appreciated the chance to speak on those students' behalf and who could benefit from, from that situation. Because it's more about, it's more than just about grades. You know, there's a lot of other pieces to consider. 
Um, can you say a little bit more about what the family community liaisons do? Sure. We, um, we do home visits to establish a loss of connection. You know, we have a high poverty district, so a lot of times the, the parents have prepaid phone numbers that are always changing. So we reestablish connection and just offer support. We, um, we really try to diagnose kind of the issue that the student is having by meeting with them and then plugging them into the right resource, whether that's counseling or one of our outside mental health providers, whether that's um, resources for addiction or um, tutoring, just, just whatever that is. We increase cultural connectivity, like I arrange shed visits for our administrators and just try to um, increase that connection between the community. And I also, um, we have a strong nonprofit called Thrive Chelan Valley that is a huge resource to us that I'm deeply involved with. And they provide food and um, resources for anything that we identify as a need. We also have like a teen center and um, so just like really connecting what the community has to offer to the students and leveraging that to the students that need it. We, what else do I do, Brad? Um, and I mean, there's just a real huge uh, advantage for administrators, I feel like, as far as connections. You know, in a, in a small community, they, they both know the community very, very well, so they can give us background on families, background on, you know, kids' life experiences and what may be impacting them. So we're just, we have so many resources, we really have to emphasize, you know, the communication factor within student services and, you know, sharing with each other because we're fortunate to have so many people, you know, working on behalf of the kids. The gal I share an office with, her name's Dia Galvan, she's Hispanic, and one of her programs is Strengthening Family. So in that program, it's really awesome. They separate the students and the, the parents, and there's a lesson, and they all work together. Then they um, bring them all back together to actually practice the skills that they've been working on, and we just see the, the real benefits from that because they target those those students and it, you just see the family start becoming more healthy and more connected to the schools. Um, she's an awesome resource. Um, well, we are coming to the end of our time. Uh, so there are questions that are still in the questions box. So if you guys over at Chelan want to type in answers and try and get a couple of people's questions answered, that would be really great. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, OSPI's resources. So if you are interested in getting started on addressing ninth grade course failure um, and freshman success, I should say, um, the, the ninth grade success page is on OSPI's website. You can just uh, type it into the search box and there's a getting started section there for you. Um, in that getting started section, you'll see that there is a reflective uh, data questions, so you can look at your data and get started there. And you could also look at this rubric, which is such a great resource because it um, kind of gives you categories for what's proactive, reactive, or passive, and allows you to kind of rate your progress there. And that's a great foundational document to check out. On the OSPI webpage, we also have links to um, our attendance page. So again, thinking about ninth grade, think about attendance also, they're usually highly related. And also we have links to Project AWARE, which works on uh, mental health. So that's another great resource for you there. Um, and this is included in our, uh, our PowerPoint presentation and that link is in that chat box. We'd also love it if you guys would take this survey to tell us how you liked our show today. We had such a great turnout of people to join us. We really appreciate that we got some feedback last month and we're trying to incorporate that. Um, so all of those wonderful things that you've said, thank you so much. And for the feedback, we are trying to get better all the time. So thank you. Next month, we are going to look at predicting graduation with early warning indicators on September, or December 13th, excuse me, from 10 to 11 a.m. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. 
And um, we really appreciate Shalann's time in spreading the word about this awesome program. So thank you so much. We're gonna leave the webinar open for a few minutes so that we can answer questions. Um, but we'll see you next month.